got it? We're ready? Well, good morning. Would you just say thank you to our worship team? Would you beep your horn? Would you clap your hands? Would you do that this morning? Uh, so grateful for all of the folks that are using their skills and their talents. I also want to say thank you to our crew that's running all of our tech, uh, who's uh, guys and ladies that are running uh, video and sound. And so I'm just so grateful for that. All the folks that came and participated to help this parking lot service happen, help this online, online service happen uh, this morning. Just grateful for all of you. And uh, I just want to remind you that a lot of what we're going to be doing, in fact, I don't know where I put it, it's somewhere here, uh, is the app. And um, uh, my phone is back here, and uh, I was following along, singing those songs, uh, so grateful for uh, just all of that technology allowing us to worship Jesus. Uh, we don't worship technology, we worship Jesus. And uh, glad that you're here today. Uh, let's just talk about a couple of things. If you are uh, able to, uh, maybe you have two devices around you. Uh, take one of those devices and jump on, fill out that connection card right now. We do that every week because we pray for every one of those needs. Uh, we respond to all of those requests. In fact, there's going to be a way for you to use it later on in the message. We want you to know about that uh, because uh, just an easy, easy thing to use. If you don't have the app, go to your app store, whether it's Google or whether it's uh, uh, the iOS store, the Apple store, and do this Harvest Church Sela. Get it, Harvest Church Sela. Uh, get that, and we uh, will just participate with you. And then I want to invite you uh, just to continue to be generous people because your generosity is impacting churches and people across the United States across the globe. I think about uh, church plants that we support and missionaries that we support uh, that are in some of them in places that uh, we can't say online because they're places where Christianity is illegal. And yet the good news is going forward. So thank you for your generosity. I invite you to use again, you can send in a check to our PO Box 245 Sela Washington, or you can uh, use one of those mobile devices uh, and find that giving tab. Go ahead and do that. As we get ready to pray this morning, I want to uh, be praying uh, for all of those that have been affected personally uh, by this COVID virus. And you're saying, if you don't know anybody, I'm, I'm saying I do. Uh, and I know folks, I know uh, yesterday, uh, a godly man in our valley whose uh, life was cut short because of COVID. And uh, his funeral was yesterday. And I just, I think about folks that are saying, hey, this is real. Let's, let's, let's acknowledge it. And so I want to just pray for those that uh, have been affected by this personally. So let's uh, get ready to pray. And if you don't know somebody uh, personally, uh, if you would be praying for those uh, in our valley and our state, our nation that have been affected. So let's join together in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we know that you're the healer, and so we come to you and we ask for you to heal. Heal people that are sick today. He, heal people that uh, are worried about getting sick. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, you to minister to those that are suffering with grief because they've lost a loved one uh, due to this, uh, to this virus. Jesus, you're greater than this virus. We acknowledge it. We we celebrate that you're the healer, you're the great physician, and you're greater than all. And so we pray today that you would remind us, give us a, a beautiful reminder that you're the one who can handle all of this. We're not going to put our faith in a vaccine. We're not going to put our faith in uh, anything apart from you because everything else seems to let us down, Lord. And so today we put our faith in the name of Jesus and all of God's people are coming together and saying, amen. I agree with that. Amen and amen. We agree that Jesus is the great physician. Today, uh, as we get into our message, uh, I, I want to acknowledge that school is just around the corner. It is just around the corner. In fact, some schools started this past week. You know, like, really? Some schools? Yes, some schools started this past week. We know that school looks 
uh, different and it's going to appear in various forms uh, this year. But I want to begin by refreshing us with a little bit of math. So let's try this. If you are in a group, you can uh, try this uh, together. If you're watching online, try this. Here we go. Uh, here, let's begin with some addition. Addition is easier than uh, uh, subtraction even, and easier than multiplication. We'll get to that. That's advanced. Addition, here it is. One plus one is, anybody? Two. It is two. If you said two, you get a gold star. Now, we can't hand out a gold star to you because that's against apparently the rules. But you get a gold star. Gold star to everyone who got that. And now let's press on to multiplication. Let's, let's move faster. Let's jump some grades. And uh, let me just tell you, if uh, your parents and you have little kids, let them try it first. If you have siblings and you have younger siblings around you, let them try this. Answer the multiplication question. Here it is. First one is 12 times 1. 12 times 1. The answer is 12. The answer is 12. Now, this is going to mess up some of you. Some of you are going to have a harder time with this one. 1 times 12 is 12. 12. I hear that. I hear that. 12. And so we have our, uh, our addition we have our multiplication. Now, I also have to let you know that there is another answer. And this is not the new math. This is another answer. If you answered for any of these, if you answered one plus one equals glory to God, you got it right. If you answered 12 times one equals glory to God, you got it right. And if you answered 12 times one or one times 12 is glory to God, you got it right. In fact, that's a triple word score right there. And you're thinking, what? Jason has finally lost it. The pandemic has affected him and he is just, he's lost his mind. He doesn't understand mathematics. Uh, as we get into this, we're going to see that these numbers are important to us today. These numbers, these, uh, in fact, these equations that we just talked about, they're important to us, but it's all going to come back to the glory of God. Because as we close out the month of August, and we are closing it out, next week is the last Sunday in the month of August, uh, we are doing this. We want to remember. We want to remember God's faithfulness, God's power, and God's love in our lives. And so today, uh, if you have a Bible, would you take that out? Would you turn in your Bible uh, to the book of Joshua? That is the sixth book of your Bible. If you're using the app, normally I would pull out my phone and say, here's the app. Uh, go to the app and you can see all of the scripture there, all of the things. In fact, you'll see the quiz we just took. The math quiz is there. In fact, you want a refresher, it's there. And I love this as we go to the sixth book of the Bible. The first five books were written by Moses. And the sixth book is dealing with his successor, Joshua. And as we jump into it, I want you to hear what it says in Joshua chapter 4, beginning with verses 1 through 7. And today's title of the message is Monumental. Think of a monument. Uh, today we're going to talk about remembering God's faithfulness, His power, His love for us. And so if you have gotten there, Joshua, arrived there, Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Here's what it says. In Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, that is the Jordan River, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men, oh, there's part of our equation, from the people, one from each tribe, a man, and command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, right down there in the middle, from every place where the priest's feet stood firmly. And bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. The first campsite, the first place they would, they would sleep that night in the promised land. They were to set up a monument. Get 12 men, get these rocks and do this. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed. A man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel. 
that this may be a sign among you. Verse 6, very important here. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And you're thinking, what does that have to do with my life? Let's, let's, not, let's not miss this right now. Let's understand that all of God's word is recorded for us. And this is the word of God for us. Amen. You can beep your horn for that. This is the word of God for us. There you go. That's good. I don't want us to miss that. Because as we get into it, you need to see that it, this was written down for you and for, for me, for us to learn from, to grow and understand as we look at history together, the history of God's faithfulness, the history of God's power, the history of God's love. You see, a little context here will help us with this. The people of Israel had been wandering for 40 years. If you thought the pandemic has lasted a long time, 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. Now at long last, they are at the edge of the river that separates them from the promised land. The promised land is just across the river. All they have to do is get across the Jordan River and they can be in the promised land. It was promised to them hundreds of years before. They were supposed to be in the promised land 40 years before, but because they did not exhibit faith and instead they exhibited fear, and we keep coming back to that, don't we? It's faith over fear that's important for us. This is now their opportunity, their second opportunity to enter the promised land and experience all that God has in store for them. And I thought, as I, I reviewed this, I thought we need to have this in our own context. L listen, if, if uh, you were an Israelite, uh, a Jewish person in that day, 40 years in the desert would be like you were stuck in modified phase one for 40 years. They were in modified phase one because phase one would have meant they were still in slavery in Egypt and God had delivered them by his power and by his might. He had delivered them from the wicked king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. He had put his power on display for the nations around them and he had led them out. He had led them out of the land and they should have been in phase four by now in the promised land, but instead they got stuck in modified phase one. Are you feeling it yet? They're stuck for 40 long years in modified phase one. And they are desperately waiting to get to phase four. And phase four could happen rapidly. They just have to cross the Jordan River, which was flowing at flood stage. And so God had to intervene on their behalf. God had been uh, leading them and protecting them for 40 years now. He had parted the Red Sea so that they could cross over on dry land. He had defeated bands of raiders that uh, planned their demise and he protected them from them, those raiders. He gave them the Ten Commandments. He'd been feeding them in the desert, manna, bread from heaven, and so much more. God had been demonstrating all along even in modified phase one, God had been demonstrating for them his faithfulness, his power, and his love. And now to confirm to the people of Israel and for us that he is still the miraculous God. He is still the powerful God. And he would be going with them into the promised land. He caused a miracle to happen. You see, when the, when the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, stepped into the raging Jordan River at flood stage. God caused the river like he did with the Red Sea. He caused a miraculous thing to happen. He caused the river to cease flowing and it to pile up, literally pile up like you would stack up blankets maybe in your hall closet to stack them up. The river itself stacked up. 
and they were able to cross over the Jordan River on dry land. See, God wasn't just for a previous generation. He was for them. And that's important for us to remember. God isn't just faithful to previous generations, other people at other times. He is faithful to us right now. And so the priest, think about this. The priest, when they stepped into the river and this happened, everybody would have been filled with awe and excitement. They would have been amazed. They would have been astounded. This was supernatural happening in their time and in their lives. And I just wanted you to get this. The first thing I, I would want you to hold on to from God's word today, I think that God would want to impress on all of us is this, that we need regular reminders of God's faithfulness and love. You might just add in there, faithfulness, power, and love. We need regular reminders of that because we're short-term people, short-term memory people. We forget things very quickly. And you, you could say this, well, I know he's been faithful in the past. We just read about it. He's, he was faithful to these people, to the people of Israel. He's been faithful to previous generations. But will he be faithful to me? Will he be faithful to us? I know that he has put his power on display. He's put his power on display again and again. For others, for others, he, he's done that when they face difficulties, when they faced harsh challenges, but does he still have the same power? If you've had those questions, maybe even in these past months, is he still the powerful God that he used to be? Is he still the faithful God that he used to be? Is he still the loving God that he used to be? Does he even know our needs? Does he care? Will he come through on our behalf? If that has been on your heart, on your mind, and Anyway, during this last time, that's why this passage is so important as he reminds the people to remember who he is and what he's done and what he is capable of doing. In fact, I, I want to just remind you of who God is. And you may have heard this. These are descriptive terms of who God is. God is omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. There's nothing outside of his reach. I don't know if he can heal this. He can. I don't know if he can overcome this. He can. I don't know if he could handle all of these things at once. He can. God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. The second thing to remember about God for the people of Israel and for us today is that he's omniscient. He's all knowing. Nothing has missed his 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 vision, his grasp, his knowledge. Nothing has escaped him. Not the little things in your life, not the big things in our world. Nothing has escaped him. He knows it all. That is not true, by the way, of the evil one, of the opponent, of Satan, the devil. He is not all-knowing. He is not all-powerful. Sometimes people put God and the devil on the same plane, and they are not. God is the creator the evil one, the one that causes all kinds of com conflict and chaos in our world, even to this moment. He is not all powerful. He is not all knowing. The third thing to remember about God is that he is omnipresent. That means everywhere at the same time, you were hoping for another all and it just doesn't fit. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at the same time. That means he can minister to the people in Guatemala at this moment and the people in China at this moment, and the people in Sila at this moment, and the people in Yakima at this moment, there's nowhere that God's spirit is not. There's nowhere where his power is limited. There's nowhere that his knowledge is cut off. Remember who God is. Remember who he is every single day. Now, if you were somebody in the nation of Israel, you might be saying this. I will never forget this moment when God piled up the river in a supernatural way. You're just not going to see that. This is not going to happen. That doesn't happen just in nature. That has to be supernatural. You say, I would never forget it. And yet, as you read the Hebrew scriptures, you read the Old Testament, you will see how the people forgot. Again and again and again, they forgot God's faithfulness. 
They forgot that he had been good to them just days before. They forgot how good he was to them, leading them out of Egypt. They forgot that he was omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. They forgot these things. And that's why we need regular reminders of God's faithfulness. We need regular reminders of God's faithfulness, power, and love. Now, I, I'm just thinking about this. If you go to verse 6, I would encourage you to star it, highlight it, do whatever you can to remember this verse because it's just a, a great reminder of how we are to pass on the truth of who God is. Verse 6 says this, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you will tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever, forever. I love that. The second thing to just maybe dive into this is that we need to share our, our eyewitness accounts of God's faithfulness and love. Did you notice this when he said, what do these stones mean to you? When your kids, when your grandkids, when your neighbor asks you, what does this mean? What an opportunity to speak of God's faithfulness, power, and love. What's this mean to you? I think one of the opportunities that we continually need to be taking advantage of is to be, sh be sharing how God has worked in our lives. And that means we need to remember how he has worked. For you to be able to say, let me tell you, let me tell you of how God met me in the middle of a difficult time, in a tragic time in my life. Let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you how God provided for a need that I had that nobody else could meet. And yet he met it. He's the provider. Let me tell you about a time when I saw God's miraculous power on display. Let me tell you. That's verse six. Let me tell you of what God did. So let's, let's do this right now. I want you to do a personal, just very quick inventory and think about where you have seen God work in your life, where, where God has met you. Answer this question. Where have you witnessed, where have I witnessed God at work? Where have you seen God's mission being accomplished? What's his mission? To seek and to save that which is lost, to bring people into his family, to change lives, not just for a little while, but for eternity. Where have I seen him doing that? I don't know if you uh, were a part of a church that used to have a time where people would stand up and give a testimony. And they would give a testimony and, it, and this, the, the testimony time was not to say how great you are or what wonderful thing you have gone through, but to say, let me share with you what God did. And it, an interesting thing that, that we don't see happen a lot of times We'll do it when we would meet together and we would run a mic around and say, hey, I just want to thank God for, I want to share what God did uh, in this way. And we would run a mic around if you've ever joined us. Remember when we used to meet indoors? <laughs> no, short-term memory. Who wants to share a testimony of what God has done? Right now, right where you're at, if you were asked today, and I hope that somebody asks you. In fact, it'd be a great exercise for you to ask one another. What has God done in your life? What would you tell them? What would you share? Would you, what would you share of God's faithfulness, his power, and his love? Oh man, there was this, God did this. And then he did this. And then he showed up here. And this is how he provided. If you were asked, where have you witnessed the power of God and the faithfulness of God this past year? Too many people are just really down on the year 2020. God has been working powerfully in the year 2020. Unfortunately, there's been so many crazy things that have happened in the year 2020. Sometimes we miss what God has done. God's power and his love in this past year. Think about it. Share it with somebody. What would you tell them? What would you tell them? Where have you seen God work this past month? 
Where has he come through? For you, for a friend, for a loved one. Where have you seen his power on display? Where have you seen him work this past week? Don't let it be general. Let it be specific. Praise God for. It's giving a testimony of. I'm an eyewitness account of what God did. What we have here in Joshua chapter 4 is an eyewitness account. God did this for us. He did things for other generations. Yeah, that's awesome. We love that. We celebrate that. Wonderful. But this is what he did for us in our time. Which brings us to number three. We need to be actively reminded of God's faithfulness and love. We're forgetful people. We, we struggle sometimes to remember what happened two days ago because we're so embroiled in what's happening today. We need to be actively reminded of God's faithfulness, his power, his love. Look at this in Joshua chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. I love that. Not kind of like what Joshua said, not kind of like what the Lord said, just as the Lord said. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged. By the way, if you're wondering the place where they lodged, one mile, 1.25 miles from the city of Jericho. And if you know anything about what God did at the city of Jericho, they were camped a mile and a quarter away from Jericho. The first place they camped was in a dangerous place. The enemy was so near them people that wanted to not only ruin their lives, but take their lives. And this is where they were to take these stones and to pile them up and laid them down there. Verse nine, and Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. So while the guys are taking their stones over out of the midst of the Jordan, 12 different guys carrying one stone apiece. Joshua himself, the leader of Israel, is busy in the middle of the river, which is still piled up until the priests left the river, until they left the riverbed, that, that water is still piled up. And he is setting up a monument as well. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. We don't know if they're there to this day, today, in 2020, but they were there when this was written down. Those stones are still there, covered over by water, but they were still there. And it says this, verse 10, for the priest bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. They stood right there. Now, this is where we come and we say, uh, this is where the math that we started with, that quiz, it wasn't just a quiz to fill up time. What you're seeing here is that they had two monuments. One plus one equals two. Two monuments. One of the monuments was built by 12 men, 12 times one rock apiece. And they built that in their first campsite. And one of the monuments, it was built by one man piling up 12 stones. You see, well, that's the reason that when we look at one plus one and 12 times one and one times 12, the answer to all of those can be mathematical and they also can be glory to God. That's why those monuments were built. And so I was thinking about that as of yesterday. Last night I was out uh, with my family and I was walking our dogs and I, I, was look, I was looking for a rock. I was looking for a rock. And so I found this. I did not take this from anyone's yard, okay? So don't be writing me a nasty note and say, go put that back in someone's yard. But I found this uh, on our walk and I carried it home halfway <laughs> until it got tired. And I set it down. Then I drove back last night and said, I need that rock. A river rock, smooth from the water. Picture these 12 men with a rock, probably bigger than this, on their shoulder, and they're taking up, up out of the river, and they're marching 
over to the place where they would camp, and this is what they built there. And it was to remind everyone of what God did. And in generations to come, no one was to remove that. They were to leave that right there and to have kids say, what do those rocks mean to you? I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you about what God did. Let me tell you of his goodness. Let me tell you of his power. Let me tell you how he, he worked and what he's doing for us even now. So here are these 12 men building this monument. In the first place they stayed in the promised land. The first thing they did was set up camp and build a monument to the Lord to remember him. And then here's Joshua down in the midst of the river digging up these rocks right around the priest. Can you picture him saying, hey, could you move your foot? Because I, I want that rock. Hey, I, I want to be able to take that one and pile it here. And he piles up 12 stones. He builds a monument himself while these other 12 guys are building a monument over here. That tells us something about this. This isn't just for some people to do. We each get to be a part of this, of remembering God's goodness and his faithfulness and his power and his love. I love this idea of setting up monuments to remember God's faithfulness. I love that. Some of you are thinking right now, I wonder how long he's going to carry that rock. Is that what you're thinking right now? It's not about the rocks. It was never about the rocks. It was always about God's power, his faithfulness, his love. These weren't special rocks. These were just river rocks. But they were a reminder of what God did in that place. Bend with your knees. And there we go. Now think about this. The 12 stones that were taken from the Jordan, they were piled up so that people could remember what God did. The 12 stones that were left in the Jordan, only God would be witnessing and seeing those rocks. Those stones were hidden in the midst of the river because the river didn't stay stacked up. As soon as the priests had crossed into the promised land, that means everybody that was supposed to be there was there. The river went back to flood stage and it covered those 12 rocks. But God remembered. God remembered. And the people remembered. God remembered his love for the people and the people remembered his love for them. Let me tell you how uh, we have two monuments that we celebrate in the church today to help us remember God's love. Today, the church has two memorials of this great truth, of God's faithfulness, of God's power, and his love. The first one is baptism. Baptism reminds us that the Spirit of God has baptized us into Christ. Who we were on that side of the river, that's not who we are anymore. He's changed us and we're on this side of the river and he's changed us and he's going to continue to change us until we are ultimately changed. Baptism says, I belong to him. The second one is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, we call it communion, common name, which points back to God's death on the cross. When I say God's death, I mean the son of God, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross his resurrection, what we look forward to, we remember every time we celebrate that, what Jesus did. And we remember that he's coming again. And we remember that we are to live for him. Here it is. Think about that. Two piles of rocks, one in the Jordan, one in the camp, two celebrations for us. One is baptism. One is the Lord's supper. Now, I just need to let you know, we have not forgotten about these. We haven't forgotten about them. In fact, we've been working hard to say, how are we going to do this? Next week, we are going to celebrate communion together. We think we have figured it out and nobody's going to get in trouble and we are going to remember Jesus. So if you're coming to the drive-in service next week, just know that we have figured it out in a COVID friendly way that you can celebrate communion together. So just be prepared for that. Be prepared in that way. If you're celebrating this online, uh, online, if you're at home, I'm looking at the camera right now. If you're celebrating this, you need to be ready for this next week. We're going to celebrate communion together. We would remember God's faithfulness and his power, his love for us. 
And so that is so good. And then I, I don't want you to forget this or miss this. We have people that are ready to get baptized. So let's get baptized. In the month of September, we're going to have a baptism. It's going to be fun and funky and weird. Uh, you say, because I don't think I've done a baptism in a parking lot before. But let's go for it. God gave that to us. And again, we have figured it out. We can do it in a honoring way, not in a legal way. We've figured it out. COVID-friendly baptism. And yes, uh, we'll have that tank out here. We'll talk about God's faithfulness and his power. Here's what you need to do. If you want to get baptized, I need you to do this right now. Either email us, baptism at harvestcc.com. That's the great one, baptism at harvestcc.com. Or just jump on to the, to the app and on your connection card, say, I want to get baptized this September. I want to get baptized. And we will talk with you. We'll be ready for you. And uh, uh, we just want you to know that we have not forgotten what God has given to us to remember him. The Lord's Supper and baptism. Let's celebrate what God has done. I love those two piles of rocks. Really formed one monument. It was one reminder of God's faithfulness and power, his love. And I'm looking forward to the day when we look back on this whole COVID crisis and we can say, look at all that God did during that time. Look at all that God did. How he was at work in the middle of it all. You see, it's not about rocks today. It's not about us carrying around chunks of stone. Do you know what the best monument that God has in this world today? It's not a statue. It's every single Christian who is following Jesus. They are the monuments of God's work. Young and old, male and female, you name it, what we've been through. It is a monument. It is a testimony. It is a eyewitness account of what God has done. His faithfulness, his love, his power. Again and again, your life is to meant to be a monument to what God has done. You're the best. You say, man, we ought, to, we ought to get a bunch of rocks and pile them up. I've got one better for you. How about we serve as portable monuments? That's what God would want. I think the people of Israel, as they thought back on this, they would say it this way. The God who was with us on the east side of the river is the same God who went with us through the river. And he was the same God who was already on the west side waiting for us, waiting to do great and mighty things on our behalf. And so here's the question I would ask for you, all of us. Can you say that God is with you? Can you say that? If you can't think of a time that God has been with you, I would ask, is he your savior? Have you surrendered your life to him? Can you say that God has changed you because he's taken away your sins? You say, I'm not sure I can say that. Today is the day for you to witness God's faithfulness, his power, and his love by surrendering your life to Jesus. If you've never given your life to Jesus, today is the day. And simply in an attitude of prayer, you come and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I can't save myself, but you have all the power. And I know that you love me. You demonstrated that when you came and lived a perfect life. You demonstrated that on the cross. You demonstrated that when you rose again for me. Jesus, take my sins and give me new life. I want to follow you. Immediately, you become a living monument of God's power and love. I would encourage you, if you pray that today, if you put your faith in Jesus today, would you let us know that? Would you email us so we can celebrate with you, so we can encourage you in your faith I want to end with this, and it's a quote from St. Patrick. Yes, the same St. Patrick from the month of March. A real man who really experienced God's power, faithfulness, and love. When he understood what it meant to have God 
living with him. Here's what he said. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in every heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of every person who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every he ear that hears me. The monument is not to be about you. It's to be about Christ. I pray that we would be people who display Jesus well this week. In fact, here's the bottom line for us. A devoted Christian is a monumental testimony to God's faithfulness, power, and love. I pray that you would be a beautiful monument wherever you go this week. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and join us as they lead us in celebrating Jesus. Wherever he takes us this week, wherever he takes you this week, that you would be a beautiful monument, not a pile of rocks, but a beautiful picture of what God has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. Let me pray for us and then team, come and lead us. Father God, we love you. We thank you that you have blessed and shown previous generations your power, your faithfulness, and your love. Jesus, do it in our day. Jesus, show it in our lives. I pray that every single Christian, every person here who's watching this online, every person who's here in the drive-in, every person who comes into contact with you, Jesus, and puts their faith in you, they would be a powerful monument of your love for us. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. It all belongs to you. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.